Hey senpai, it's your Kohai, and today we have our very first Yoshitoku FNX Japanese doll figure. Very excited, seen a few of these online, but never actually had one until now. So we're very excited to open the box. It is now officially our second most expensive figure. If you didn't know, Yoshitoku is a Japanese doll company that makes 1-4 scale-ish figures, normally geisha dolls, with the real cloth kimonos. Now this is the Data Live number 4, Kurumi Tokisagi figure, 1-4 scale, with MSRP of 168,300 yen. We're very excited, so let's get to unboxing. Starting with the box, this has already been a terrible experience so far. This box basically comes in a cardboard box that's shipped straight from Furyu. Only has a single thin layer of bubble wrap around the box, so there's really no room for it to shift. And so our box actually came very dented. You can see here on the back. And it doesn't help that it's also made out of the terrible thin cardboard. Normally, we try to save the breaking of the seal until the actual video. But you can see that the seal is already broken. And that is because we were afraid that the figure was damaged. And so we had to actually open the box to ensure that she wasn't damaged. We didn't open the clear packaging so that we could do that on camera. And so thankfully, it doesn't look like she's damaged but I guess we'll see when we get to the actual unboxing. As far as the design goes you can see on the front that it just has Kurumi's name and the company's name and then the entire box is just black except for the company details on the back. So overall not a lot of thought into the design. You could argue that they're going for a classy clean approach. It just seems a little lazy to me for a 170,000 yen figure. Here's the first layer of the inner packaging. Initial impressions are that this is a gorgeous, gorgeous kimono. This figure has an extreme amount of presence. It also has very terrible molding fitments for the arm pieces and the head. It had instructions that were thankfully in English, but I even had to call in the big guns and even he had some trouble getting the pieces to fit in correctly. Unfortunately, the base for this figure is made out of an extremely thin plastic. You can even see the support structure underneath because it's so thin. For a figure of this price, I would expect it to have a black acrylic piece. There is the stand, which is nice, which makes it seem more luxurious, although it is also made out of a hollow plastic. The pegs for the feet are also plastic, and for a figure with this amount of weight attached to a thin plastic base, I would expect metal pegs so that they don't bend or break over time. Before we dive into paint modeling, we'll go ahead and talk about this kimono here because while it kind of does fall under both categories, our rating system is normally based on a PVC figure and this is a cloth piece, so it's kind of its own separate thing. Overall, this kimono is gorgeous. I mean, it is just absolutely stunning. And I am not a seamstress. I do not sew, but I will try my best to describe it. Let's start with how this kimono is affixed to the figure. So in the middle, it feels more mannequin-esque. This kimono is completely glued to the figure. So you fans out there, they want to undress her. Well, sorry to disappoint you, but you can't unless you're going to force cast off. There are no wires in this kimono, but it still holds its structure very well because it's a very thick material. When looking at this figure, I think I can identify four different fabrics that are used. You have this fabric underneath, which is the same fabric of her obiage, which is this yellow piece here. You have the haneri, which is her underlayer, which is a white. And then you have her obi, 
and this fabric on top that they use for the front portion of her kimono. The only part of this kimono that has actual embroidery is going to be on her obi. So all of this gold foil detailing that you see here is actually stitched in. While we're also talking about her obi, the obi jime, which is this rope here, is actually made out of real rope material, so that's a nice detail. For the outer layer of the main part of the kimono, it's all printed, so you have this line work here that almost looks like a maze, and then all of the flowers are printed, and you have this shimmery gold paint that kind of details everything, as well as creates some other line work, and it makes everything really pop and stand out. All in all, this kimono is absolutely mesmerizing, and as far as I can tell, pretty much perfect in fit, print, and quality. And it's truly what makes this figure, because everything else is a little bit weaker in comparison. Transitioning to the PVC elements, which I do have expertise in, we're pretty much looking at your average one-fourth figure, albeit a very pretty one. Looking at the paint and starting with the hair, we'll basically see Alter's Honolulu technique, which is this translucent piece where they've gone over it with a dark airbrush and then hit it with a shimmery silver to give it highlights. Although it does give a greater effect on this figure because this figure is a larger scale, so it casts more shadows and you can see more of that depth. Moving to the top of her head, we are greeted with the traditional Kurumi headband, and we actually do see a lot of shading in these orange folds. There's this gold line down the middle, which unfortunately they do stray in and out of that line. And then they have added in her kamikazari, which is her hair ornament, where unfortunately we do see a lot less shading. There is some, it's just not very dark, and so it doesn't give it a lot of depth. Kurumi's face is one of the most captivating pieces to me besides her kimono, and that is because they've added this really pretty lipstick onto her lips, and her eye decals are set nicely, but they're also very vibrant, which I don't really see in a lot of figures for some reason, and it definitely gives this figure a lot of life. On her neck piece here, again, we see the shading on the orange piece, but the line art on the buckle is not precise. Her skin is very soft, but there's not a lot of shading. And the fingernail polish on her nails is offset on some of her fingernails. When it comes to her guns, there is a little bit of shading, albeit not very much. In the middle, you have this lighter brown color, and then you have a darker brown on the edges. All of the metal pieces are painted like a shimmery gunmetal color that's gray. And then you have this red line work here that gives it some detailing. Her shoes... Pretty much the same thing where there is a little bit of shading but not very much in general the modeling is very clean on this figure there are no pieces added back into her hair which is impressive since most figures do have those pieces added back in so it mostly looks like one solid piece i do wish they would have added more details to her kamikazari or the hair ornament just because there's not a lot of shading there her hands are nicely modeled and the fingernails are modeled in for a figure of this size, I would have liked the guns to have been a little bit more detailed, but there are these embellishments here, which are nice. The real kicker, though, are these seams here and here on her guns and under her neck here. Although, if you display her in her normal fashion, then you don't see them, so they at least did a good job of hiding them. As I mentioned earlier, her joints do not fit together very well. It's very hard to put her arms and her head in, and you have to apply a lot of force. So I just wish those would have been more clean and precise to be easier to put together. So you don't have to be afraid of breaking off some pieces while assembling her. This figure is not based off of an artwork, but it's definitely Kurumi. It's kind of like East Dream's Albedo, where it's more of a model-esque Kurumi. But, I mean, if you're going to get dressed up in a kimono, you're obviously going to put on some makeup to look cute for the festival. So overall, I think it captures Kurumi's essence very well. This pose is definitely meant to showcase the kimono. There is a little bit of movement due to the fabric, but overall it's a pretty average pose. She's definitely very bishoujo though, very pretty and captivating, and it definitely reminds me of one of those last panels in a manga of where your main character is at the festival, and I think that it captures that presence. Before we move on to our rating system, we really need to elaborate on value because it's very hard for us to judge 
the subjective value of this figure. Our objective scale is meant to rate PVC figures because at the end of the day, we're exchanging money for plastic. And most figures are made out of PVC, so we can compare them to each other a lot better than we can compare this figure to others, since not a lot of figures have this cloth piece. And because of that, we know that it's going to get objectively a very low score because it's going to weigh a lot less than if all of her was made out of PVC. So because of this, we have to put a lot more thought into our subjective reading. On Yoshitoku's website, most of the dolls, which are approximately one fourth size and scale, are in the 30 to 40,000 yen range. Now there is one doll that is 120,000 yen, but the website doesn't really elaborate on ma what makes it different from all the other figures. So for all we know, it could be some kind of exotic material rather than the complexity of the kimono. So it's very hard to judge Kurumi's kimono based on these numbers. In Kurumi's favor, her kimono is a lot more detailed and elaborate than the ones on the website. For comparison, we can look at Volks' Dolphy Dream series, which is about a one-third scale doll. For an example, the most recent special edition kimono for Miku was only 14,300 yen, and the non-special editions were more in the 7,000 to 8,000 yen range. Albeit, Volks' kimonos are more simplistic in design and have a more mass-produced quality to them. So as you can see, when trying to assess the value of this figure, we have two very different extremes. You can maybe say that this is a 120,000 yen kimono, like on Yoshitoku's website, and then you add in the 30,000 yen of a one-fourth scale figure, and you get to a 150,000 yen price point, which is only 20,000 yen off from the MSRP, which maybe you could say is the Kurumi tax plus the low production amount of the figure. On the other hand, you could say that this might be only a 30,000 yen kimono when you compare it to like Volks kimonos, for example, and then you have the 30,000 yen of the one-fourth figure price. And then you're only at like 60,000 yen, and that is nowhere near that 170,000 yen MSRP. So as you can see, there's a lot of things we're going to have to consider when we make our determination about the subjective value. So with that, let's give her a score. Starting with the box, it's about as horrible as it can get. It's made out of the thin cardboard, it has almost no design, and it's shipped in a box that is just unacceptable for the price of this figure. So it gets a 1 out of 5. Moving on to production, starting with paint quality, whereas the print and accents on her kimono are perfect, the paint on Kurumi herself is closer to that of an average one four scale figure, so she gets a 12 out of 15. For modeling, in her normal orientation she looks fantastic, but she's hiding a bad seam on her neck and her two guns. What's worse are the things you can't see, which are the fitment for her neck and her arms, so she gets an 11 out of 15. For a figure this expensive, the base is about as cheap as it gets. It's just a thin see-through piece of plastic that's made out of one color. It has a billboard that gives it a nice aesthetic, but it's also made out of cheap plastic that can scratch easily, so it gets a 2 out of 10. Moving on to artistry, under 2D versus 3D. This is Kurumi under the fireworks on a New Year's Eve in 3D form, so she gets a 10 out of 10. Her pose is pretty generic, and it's mostly used to show off the kimono, so it gets a 6 out of 10. The face is one of the best parts of this figure aside from the kimono, and Kurumi looks really cute when she's all dolled up, so she gets a 10 out of 10. For Moe, she's truly a bishoujo and she's absolutely stunning, so she gets a 10 out of 10. Moving on to value, objectively we know she's going to do poorly because our scale is geared towards solid PVC figures, which is not really going to account for the full value of the kimono since it doesn't weigh very much. Kurumi costs 168,300 yen and weighs 1,160 grams, giving her a price per gram of 145.09, which is a 1 out of 5. Subjectively, there's a lot to consider, but when you see her in person, she's truly awe-inspiring and seems to be more worthy of her price tag, so I'm going to give her a 3 out of 5. For displayability, she is a museum quality piece that is worthy of showcasing, but her dimensions make that difficult to do, so I'll give her a 4 out of 5. This brings the total for the Kurumi Japanese doll to a 70 out of 100.
Is bigger better? This year we have fortunately been able to obtain the two most expensive Kurumi figures thus far, and they just happen to also be our two most expensive figures in our collection. This one 2.5 scale Kurumi is 2,000 yen more expensive than this Kurumi, but we also gave her a 49 out of 100, and now this Kurumi has a 70 out of 100. So the question is, if you were spending the money, would you rather have quantity or quality? These two figures are actually part of Senpai's collection, but if I were to personally spend the money on one of these two figures, I would spend it on this one without a shadow of a doubt, and that's because it's in a different class of its own. Now don't get me wrong, we gave this figure a 70 out of 100, which is far from perfect, but there are some unexcusable things of a figure of this price point. And some of those things are basic, such as fitment quality, base, and we also judge the box, which docks it a lot of points. That being said, once you get past all of that and it's assembled and in front of you, there's no other figure in our collection that can compare to this one. This is one of the only figures that we own that can stand by itself. You could put it in a case on a pedestal with lights and it would have that museum quality presence. People would stop and look at it and know that it's something special. Out of nine years of figure collecting, Senpai now says that this is his favorite figure out of his entire collection. And hopefully this won't be the last figure that we own of this series. Well, that's it for today's video. If you like this kind of content, please subscribe. You can find a way of supporting our channel in the description below. Well, until next time, senpai, bye!